Welcome back to Harbour Unboxed. Okay, so yesterday we checked out the Ryzen 9 5950X, AMD's new $800 US 16 core 32 thread flagship AM4 processor. And today we're checking out the slightly cut down version, the Ryzen 9 5900X. This is a 12 core, 24 thread version. It's available for $550 US. And that makes the 5900X around 8% cheaper per core when compared to its bigger brother. Of course, AMD can get away with charging a premium for that 16 core model, given that it faces no real competition. That being the case, the 12 core 5900X is priced to compete with Intel's Core i9-10900K, their flagship 10 core processor which is meant to retail for $530 US, though due to supply troubles, it does typically retail for between $550 and $600 US. In any case, they are roughly the same price. So now what we need to find out is how they stack up in terms of performance. The 5950X was a beast, so I'm expecting good things here. And really with the only major change having been made to the core count, the 5900X should impress. The clock speeds are much the same. The boost frequency has been lowered by just 100 megahertz, while the base frequency has increased by 300 megahertz. And because there's still two CCDs, it packs a total L3 cache of 64 megabytes. Once again, I'm not gonna bother pouring over all the Zen 3 architectural improvements, rather we'll skip that stuff and jump right into what you guys want, the benchmarks. Before we do that though, let's take a quick look at yet another new AM4 motherboard. Yesterday, we got our first look at the ASUS ROG Crosshair 8 Dark Hero, and today we're getting our first look at the MSI B550 Unify, a new extreme B550 motherboard that includes, well, pretty much everything. The highlights include a 16-phase VRM using Infineon TDA 21490 amp power stages, a six-layer PCB with two ounce thickened copper, all aluminum extended heat sinks with dedicated VRM heat pipe, four M.2 slots with double-sided M.2 shield frozer cooling, and DDR4 AXMP support for up to DDR4 5800 memory. There's also a Unify X version with just two memory dims. I like to think of this as the Unified Buildzoid Edition. In other words, it's geared towards memory overclocking. MSI claims the Unify X can do DDR4 5800 with the 4000G series processors and DDR4 5300 with third gen Ryzen while the standard Unify, the model that I have, can achieve DDR4 5600 with the 4000G series, though they are yet to make any Ryzen 5000 series claims. Later this month, I will put together a detailed Zen 3 memory performance guide, and I'll be using the standard Unify for the bulk of my testing. Also, for those of you wondering, the board is priced at $290 US, so it is a Gigabyte B550 Master competitor. Anyway, that's enough about the B550 Unify. I'll play with that board more at a later date. Back to the Ryzen 9 5900X. For testing, the AMD CPUs, the MSI X570 Godlike was used, along with four 8GB G-Skill Triton Z DDR4 3200CL14 memory modules for a 32GB capacity. And then cooling all test systems is the Corsair IQ H150i Elite Capilix AIO. Finally, please note for all the productivity testing, we're using the GeForce RTX 2080 Ti, but for all the gaming benchmarks, I've gone back and updated all of our numbers with the RTX 3090. I've also added some new games as well, so let's get into the graphs. First up, we have Cinebench R20, and wow, 8,487 points. That is pretty insane. That is a 17% increase from the 3900X, making the 5900X just 8% slower than the 3950X. That's pretty impressive given that it packs 25% fewer cores. Then when compared to the Core i9-10900K, the processor it's actually priced to compete with, it's 32% faster, and although it does have 20% more cores, that's still a very strong performance advantage. Running the single core benchmark reveals why the 5900X is so much faster than the 10900K in Cinebench R20. Here we're looking at a 16% boost to the single thread performance. It's also a 23% improvement from the 3900X, and with a similar single core score to that of the 5950X, I'm expecting a very strong gaming performance. Now, just before we move on, here's a look at how the 5950X clocks in each of the Cinebench R20 tests. For the multi-core test where all cores are heavily loaded, the 5950X clocks at around 4.3 gigahertz and AMD advertises a base clock frequency of 3.7 gigahertz. So here we are well above that. AMD also advertises a max boost clock frequency of 4.8 gigahertz 
and this should be achieved in single core or lightly threaded workloads. In the Cinebench single core test, the 5900X typically operated at 4.9 GHz, so that's 100 MHz over the advertised spec. AMD obviously wanted to ensure that the max boost frequency was not only easily achieved, but often exceeded to avoid any Zen 2-like boost clock drama. Next up we have 7-Zip, and here we're looking at compression performance. We see that when compared to its predecessor, the 5900X is 17% faster, and quite incredibly is able to just edge out the 3950X, making it 37% faster than the 10900K. Now, when decompressing, we find that SMT is more useful here, and as a result, the 3950X is able to pull ahead, though the 5900X is just 8% slower and is still offering a substantial 18% performance boost over the 3900X. As a result, it's again much faster than Intel's best, beating the 10900K by a whopping 43% margin. AES encryption performance is slightly improved with Zen 3, and this is an area where Zen 2 already excelled. Therefore, it's no surprise to see the 5900X dominating the 10900K by a massive 52% margin. Moving on to Blender, and here we're looking at a 12% performance boost for the 5900X over the 3900X, and that meant it was 22% faster than the 10900K. When compared to the 3950X, it was just 13% slower, and then 18% slower than the 5950X. We found previously when testing the 5950X that the new Zen 3 architecture absolutely shreds in the V-Ray benchmark, and we're again seeing exactly that with the new 12-core model. Here the 5900X basically matched the older 16-core 3950X, and that meant it was 23% faster than its predecessor, and 32% faster than its primary competitor, the 10900K. So, a bit of a shellacking there. The last rendering benchmark we have is Corona, and here the 5900X is much faster than the 3900X, boosting performance by 22%. Again, delivering 3950X light performance. That's quite an incredible gen-on-gen -gen improvement, and it also meant that the 5900X was 24% faster than the 10900K. For those of you interested in code compilation performance, we see that the 5900X is just 9% faster than the 3900X, so one of the smaller gains we've seen so far, in fact it might actually be the smallest. Still, despite that, it did manage to beat the 10900K by a very convincing 26% margin. DaVinci Resolve Studio 16, using the Puget Systems benchmark, actually provides the weakest gains we've seen yet, as here the 5900X was just 8% faster than the 3900X, though that did allow it to roughly match the 3950X, so certainly not a bad result, and it was comfortably ahead of the 10900K. Adobe Premiere Pro 2020 lowers the bar even further. Here the 5900X was just 5% faster than the 3900X, while it was just 9% faster than the 10900K. Still, a 9% performance advantage for roughly the same money is hardly anything to sneeze at, certainly given that this does appear to be a worst case scenario. The strong single core performance comes in handy when testing with Photoshop. Here the 5900X matched the 5950X, and that meant it was 10% faster than the 10900K, and a whopping 20% faster than its predecessor, the 3900X. We're again seeing strong performance gains over Zen 2, this time in After Effects, another application that still relies heavily on single thread performance. Here the 5900X was 15% faster than the 3900X, and 13% faster than the 10900K, while it almost matched the 5950X. Now here's a look at power consumption by measuring total system usage in Blender. As you can see, the 5900X matched the power usage of the 3900X exactly which is very impressive given they both use the exact same 7 nanometer process. And also the fact that the Zen 3 part was able to boost performance in Blender by 12%. Moreover, when compared to the 10900K, the 5900X reduced total system consumption by 23%. Okay, time for some gaming benchmarks, and we'll start with Far Cry New Dawn. And please note, again, I am using the GeForce RTX 3090 for all the game benchmarks. The 5900X matched the 5950X exactly with 128 FPS, making it 6% slower than the 10900K, so a little bit disappointing given the dominant application performance, but still a solid result overall and a double digit performance improvement from the 3900X. The 5900X also trails the 10900K in Rainbow Six Siege, albeit by just a 5% margin. That meant it was again seen matching the 5950X to provide an 8% boost over the 3900X. Not an amazing result given some of the margins we've seen, but it was enough to edge out some of the lower core count Intel processors such as the 10700K. 
Moving on to the newest game we're testing with, Watch Dogs Legion, and here we see a very strong performance from the 5900X, placing it on par with the 10700K and just 2 FPS down on the 10900K, so basically the same performance. That's also a rather large 15% boost over the 3900X, which struggled against even the Core i5-10400 at this low resolution. We're also seeing some big performance gains in F1 2020. Here the 5900X was 21% faster than the 3900X, hitting 272 FPS with the RTX 3090. That's a great result, and it meant the new 12-core Ryzen processor was just 2% slower than the 10900K, which is close enough in my opinion to deem a draw, as not even the most pro gamers will be able to notice that difference. The performance uplift in Horizon Zero Dawn is again very solid. Here the 5900X was 15% faster than the 3900X, and more crucially was able to match the 10900K, or really it was able to edge it out by a few frames for what is basically the same performance. Performance in Borderlands 3 is only slightly improved. Here the 5900X was just 5% faster than the 3900X, though that was enough to get it within range of the 10900K, losing by just a 4% margin. As seen previously in the 5950X review, these new Zen 3 processors are absolute beasts in Death Stranding, and the 5900X matched the 16-core model exactly, making it 12% faster than the 10900K, and quite incredibly, 35% faster than the 3900X. That is a truly amazing generational performance leap. The 5900X is also able to match the 5950X and show off the Tomb Raider, and that meant it was 4% faster than the 10900K. So a win, but close enough to call a tie in my opinion. Still, it's incredible to see how much of an improvement AMD has made here, as they're able to beat the old 3900X by a 26% margin. Again, really amazing stuff. The Hitman 2 performance is also mighty impressive, though here the 5900X couldn't quite match the 5950X, but even so, it was still 7% faster than the 10900K, and 34% faster than the 3900X. 34%, that, again, amazing stuff. I know I keep saying that, but damn, you've got to admit, it really is an amazing generational leap. I keep saying that as well, but yeah, let's just move on. Performance in Star Wars Squadrons is again strong, matching the 10900K though it did edge it out quite convincingly for the 1% low performance. Then we see a 27% performance boost over the 3900X, taking the average frame rate from 247 FPS to 314 FPS. And you know what that is? Actually, I'm not going to say it. Let's just move on and check out the last title tested. The Sirius Sam 4 results are again very impressive. Here the 5900X was 11% faster than the 10900K, and wait for it, 47% faster than the 3900X. What an amazingly amazing generational leap. Seriously though, what more can you say about that? Last generation, AMD were down in the midfield, competing with Core i5 parts when heavily CPU limited, and this generation, they're well out in front, being the best mainstream desktop Core i9 part the blue team has to offer. Here's a look at the average performance across the 11 games tested. As we just saw, for the most part, the 5900X matched the 5950X, so no surprises to see them delivering the same 214 FPS on average. This also meant that overall the 5900X and 10900K are on par when it comes to gaming performance, or at least in our small sample of games. On that note, I am looking very forward to a 40 game head-to-head -head benchmark with these processors. Anyway, getting back to the testing here. It was also very impressive to see a 20% performance increase over the 3900X, and I know AMD claimed a 19% IPC improvement, but still, seeing that translate into real-world gains in games is really something else. I guess it's a case of seeing is believing. Now let's take a look at overclocking performance. I was able to hit an all-core 4.6 GHz overclock with my 5900X using 1.375 volts. So not quite as good as the 5900X's 4.7 GHz overclock, but still a solid all-core overclock. This boosted the Cinebench R20 multi-core performance by 7%, so not amazing and certainly nothing like the 20% boost the 5950X received, but it is free performance assuming that you have a decent cooler and motherboard. That said, I don't recommend this overclock as it does reduce single core performance. Previously, the 5900X hit 4.9 GHz in this benchmark. Now we're limiting it to 4.6 GHz and that reduced the score by 
That said, the overclock is certainly useful for any core heavy applications, especially if you're willing to sacrifice some efficiency in order to get that extra performance. That said, the gains aren't amazing, as seen in Cinebench R20's multi-core test. Again, we're looking at about a 6% boost to performance. For that 6% performance boost, the total system consumption increased by 16%, and while that's still 11% less than a stock 10900K, it is a reduction in performance per watt. For the most part, I don't think gamers are going to want to overclock the 5900X, at least not the way we have. Perhaps per CCX overclocking will be a little bit better. Here we're looking at a 5% performance reduction in Rainbow Six Siege, though obviously you'll only see that when heavily CPU bound, which isn't often the case when gaming. And we do see a slight performance improvement in Far Cry New Dawn, as the overclock increased to the average frame rate by 2%, so that is something. Okay, so let's move on to take a look at operating temperatures, voltages, and frequency. Here's a quick comparison between the Ryzen 9 3900X and 5900X. Both have been tested in a 21 degree room using the Corsair IQ H150i Elite Caplix AIO on the MSI X570 Godlike installed in the Corsair Obsidian 500D. Here we're seeing that the 5900X ran 7 to 8 degrees cooler than the 3900X under the same test conditions, despite running at slightly higher clock speeds using the same 7 nanometer process. Part of this will be down to the 7 nanometer process maturing, but AMD is also claiming some architectural optimization as well. And we see that these enhancements also allow for a slightly lower V core, which again will have helped to reduce the power consumption and therefore thermals. Okay, time for the price versus performance analysis starting once again with Cinebench R20. Here we see that the 5900X came out costing 25% less than the 10900K, with the Intel processor priced at $550, which is the typical asking price at this point in time. Though I have seen it selling for as high as $600. It should be priced at $530 US, but with spotty availability, you'll often be paying at least $550. Using a less favourable program like Premiere still sees the 5900X delivering more value than the 10900K as it was 8% more cost effective. Not a major difference, but as I said, this was one of the less favourable applications for the 5900X. Despite currently costing almost $100 more than the 3900X, the 5900X still costs 5% less per frame. That's quite a surprising result, but then it was 26% faster and shut off the Tomb Raider. When compared to the 10900K, it was just 4% cheaper per frame. The 11 game average looks slightly different. Basically, the 5900X offers the same level of value for CPU limited gaming as the 3900X, despite costing $90 US more in our comparison. Also, when compared to the 10900K, we're looking at the same level of value for gaming. Okay, so that concludes all the blue bar graphs. Now it's time to start wrapping this one up. And I've got to say, as impressed as I was with the Ryzen 9 5950X, I've found reviewing the 5900X to be a lot more interesting. And I guess that's mostly because it does have an actual competitor in the same price bracket. At $800 US, the 5950X is in a league of its own, not just for price, but also in terms of performance. The 5900X, I feel that's a little more realistic for most of you looking at building a high-end system, and frankly for gamers it just makes a lot more sense. The question now is, for gamers looking to build a high-end system, which CPU do you buy, the 10900K or the 5900X? Honestly though, for the vast majority of gamers, it's not really going to matter, or at least not right now. Performance is going to be roughly the same, and even when CPU limited, 99% of the time you won't be able to tell the difference. That said, looking forward a little bit into the future, the 5900X does appear as though it's going to be the better CPU. Obviously it has stronger single core performance, and with that it also has more cores to boot. As a result, when looking at the newer, more demanding games, such as Death Stranding and Serious Sam 4, for example, we see that Ryzen leads by a good margin. Therefore, I foresee a situation in one to two years time where the 5900X is leading the 10900K by a comfortable margin in most demanding titles. Though that is, of course, speculation on my part based on what we've seen here. Fact is, though, it has 20% more cores and those cores support greater throughput. So it should certainly age better. Again, I'm really keen to test a lot more games, but at least for now, you can check out the bevy of reviews online. Jared over at Jared's Tech, for example, has put together an excellent head-to-head -head battle between the 5900X and 10900K, featuring a number of games not tested here. He actually let me steal one of his graphs to show you. Here's a look at his CSGO data, where the 5900X beat the 10900K by a 17% margin at 1080p. 
He's also got resolution scaling data for you as well. So if you're interested in more benchmarks, I recommend you check his video out. I'll include a link in the video description. Now, circling back to an earlier point, for the most part, you're likely going to be GPU limited when gaming, and that means you probably won't notice a difference between the 10900K and 5900X, at least in the short term. The 5900X does have the advantage of much greater power efficiency, so it will save you a bit of thermal output and I guess shave a few cents off the old power bill. There's also plenty of PCIe 4.0, which will prove very beneficial at some point in the future. Again, just another reason why the 5900X is almost certainly gonna age much better than the 10900K. Then for those of you running any kind of application, especially a core heavy workload, the choice is even more obvious. Worst case, the 5900X is only slightly faster, but best case, it's around 40% faster, and typically we saw gains in the 20 to 30% range which is obviously very significant given the similar price. I've actually been trying to work out why you'd buy a Core i9-10900K now over the Ryzen 9 5900X. In fact, I was so stumped by this one that I started asking around with a few other reviewers and no one else really had any ideas either. The only advantage the 10900K has is one more generation of CPU support on the same platform, which should get you PCIe 4.0 support, though it's not clear if Z490 motherboards will support that feature. We know Z590 will, but not quite sure about those Z490 motherboards. For now though, Intel looks to be out of the game at the high end, and I suspect things are only going to get worse for the blue team as we work down the Zen 3 product stack. The Ryzen 9 5900X really is a mighty good CPU, and for the 10900K to even be considered, in my opinion, it would need to be priced no more than $500 US, though ideally less than that given the lack of PCIe 4.0. I am genuinely blown away by what we've seen here, and I can't wait to check out the Ryzen 7 5800X. That video will be live on the channel tomorrow, uh, the same time this video went live, though if you're not watching this video as it went live, then that's just going to be confusing. Anyway, there is a... If you're watching this in the future, there will be a 5800X review. So yeah, sorry if I've confused anyone, uh, but that's gonna do it for this one. I won't confuse you any further, apart from to say that you can join us over on Patreon or Floatplane, so one or the other. Uh, you don't have to support us on both, but yeah, sign up to one of those and it will give you access to stuff like our monthly live streams, our Discord chat, behind the scenes videos, Q&A stuff. Uh, yeah, very interesting. We are new to Floatplane, so you can get high bitrate 4K video there. But we also offer that stuff for members who sign up on Patreon. It's just an alternate YouTube channel where you better access that. Anyway, if you're interested, the links for that stuff is in the video description. If not, that is perfectly fine. And I would like to just thank you for watching this video. I'm your host, Steve, and I'll see you again next time.